The NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080 was an absolute gaming beast when it launched in May of 2016. And despite the fact that 15 year old me would never have been able to afford one back in the day, they're getting pretty cheap going into March 2023. For less than $190, you get a killer 1080p card that, while not as feature rich as the newer offerings from either NVIDIA, AMD, or Intel, I'd argue that this card occupies a performance per dollar sweet spot when it comes to 1080 and 1440p gaming. Let's take another look at the GTX 1080 and see how the card is holding up in 2023. Before I get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to leave a like and or a comment if there's something you think I missed in this video. Whether it be your personal experience with the card or even just general ideas or questions, they're welcome and I'm hoping this video can serve as a general area to get information related to the 1080 and how it performs. Without anything else to say, let's dive into the specs of the 1080 and see how the card has aged. The dive featured in the GTX 1080 is the fully unlocked TSMC 16nm GP104-400A1 graphics processing unit. With a total of 7.2 billion transistors printed on a 314 square millimeter piece of silicon, the transistors comprise the logic gates and cache for the 20SMs featured, which compared to prior gen's Maxwell 2.0 is physically smaller than the fully unlocked GM200 chip, while also utilizing roughly 800 million less transistors. When we get to the performance of the 1080 later in the video, you'll come to understand why this is impressive. But for now, this chip is technically less beefy than the 28 nanometer based GM200, but offers a more feature rich CUDA implementation. Within each SM, the Pascal architecture calls for 8 texture mapping units, giving us 160 total on this card, and also implements additional vector dot product instructions not found in Maxwell. This gives Pascal the ability to run Intel ZSS DP4A fallback implementation giving it a leg up over the older generation of cards. It also introduces FP16 support, meaning that this card is able to operate on the smaller floating point data types, but admittedly not very effectively, where Ampere and Turing both allow for either a 2 to 1 or 1 to 1 FP16 to FP32 compute ratio, Pascal comes in at 1 to 64, which is actually half the amount of the FP64 units. If your workloads utilize FP16 intrinsics on the GPU, then Ampere is probably your best bet as those cards are dropping in price if you're looking in the right places. Ada or Hopper GPUs are probably your best option though if you're using double precision floating point numbers in your algorithm, as the clock speeds and additional SMs mean those cards are more beefy in those particular workloads. In terms of actual compute performance, the 1080 sports a stock pixel fill rate of just under 111 gigapixels per second and a texture fill rate of just over 277 gigapixels per second. This comes behind the Titan X Pascal and the monstrously specced Arc A750, but the power on hand is more than enough to texture and render games and scenes at 1080p 60fps, and even for some light professional workloads. This leads to the cache configuration and memory controllers, which feed not only the CUDA cores but also the rasterization operation pipelines. As a general design feature, Pascal SMs utilize 48 kilobytes of private L1 cache, and this can be used to store instructions or data. However, as a part of the GP104 chip on board, there's only 2 megabytes of shared L2 cache, which is quite restrictive when compared to newer cards from Nvidia, AMD, and even Intel. This means the CUDA cores will be pinging the GDDR5X more often, which introduces additional latency inherent in communicating between different integrated circuits. To combat this, the 1080 sports 832-bit GDDR5X memory controller scattered around the outskirts of the die. This leads to an 8x8 gigabit memory chip topology, and enables 256 bits of data to be transferred per clock flip. With a transfer rate of 10 gigabit per second per line, the card has a total available bandwidth of 320 gigabytes per second to the GPU and its included circuitry. This falls behind the new GDDR6 standard, which clocks to 14 gigabit per second and beyond, meaning that the preceding 2080 has a solid 29% lead in terms of total available bandwidth to the core. This simply translates to effects work such as sprites and especially grass for some reason to cause a more noticeable dip in performance when they're on screen. This will happen with literally all GPUs though, so it's not unique to the 1080, but just keep in mind that this card is sporting an older memory standard that while still pretty fast just can't keep up in the raw specs department. 
To feed power to the GPU, this card comes with a single 8-pin PCIe power connector, hinting at the performance per watt gains of Pascal over Maxwell and especially Kepler. Keep in mind though that this can depend on the flavor you're picking up. Some come with an additional 6-pin, while others may come with a second 8-pin, so check to make sure your power supply can support the card even though it isn't all that power hungry. With an official TDP of 180 watts, the card usually settles at between 150 to 200 watts, with the higher end of that range only showing up infrequently when the card begins a workload. The Founders Edition flavor I've got isn't ideal in terms of cooling, but it keeps the card from melting or overheating. It just means that overclocking headroom will be limited. Compared to other third-party models, I would strongly recommend picking up a 2 or 3 fan design, because the blower style not only doesn't push a particularly large volume of air very effectively, but also gets kind of loud when under load. I would take the numbers you'll see later in this video as more of a worst case scenario for performance, as clocks will ramp up when the GPU is adequately cooled. While it may not work all that well, the shroud does look pretty cool, and this design along with the Ampere Founders editions are easily my favorite that Nvidia has produced. Clock speeds on the 1080, like previously mentioned, are pretty dependent on the cooler you've got on your specific model. On the Founders Edition, clocks stabilize at about 1750MHz out of the box, which is perfectly adequate considering the base and boost clocks of 1607 and 1733MHz respectively. In the past when I modded this card to have an AIO in the die, the card had a frequency wall at 2100MHz, which is pretty impressive as these were the first Nvidia cards to hit these somewhat high clock speeds. Core voltage control also doesn't really allow for much tuning with the maximum potential voltage being about 1.1 on the core, and 1.35 on the GDDR5X. Even with the extra voltage, the card still hits a frequency wall at just under 2100MHz, and trying to push beyond made the card unstable and or artifact. Clocks aren't really anything special, though they aren't as low as Maxwell, but they certainly aren't as high as the new ADA cards. To get a better idea of how these specs translate to real-world performance, I threw the 1080 in my test bench, consisting of my new ASUS ROG Strix Z590E gaming Wi-Fi and my trusty i7-11700K clock to a stable 5GHz all-core, and 5.1GHz boost on cores 0 and 1. However, considering the 1080 can bottleneck an older i7-8700K, I don't think it'll be super relevant, as I've also removed a few CPU-bound benchmark titles. Paired with the 11700K, I've got 64 gigs of dual rank 3200 mega transfer per second CL16 DDR4 to prevent the system from having to write to the page file. This should also theoretically reduce some CPU cause stuttering, as I won't need to stream data as much from secondary storage, since it'll just be able to store it all in main memory. Even so, to store the games we'll be testing, I've got a 1TB Western Digital Black SN770 PCIe4 NVMe SSD which has a sustained read speed of just under 5GB per second, which is better than almost all PCIe 3-based drives, but is also kind of fun to include because games load so much more quickly. One thing I have noticed though is that having a fast SSD specifically to reduce load times is kind of pointless in most multiplayer games, because you'll load in and you'll still have to wait 30 plus seconds for either console players to finish loading in before you can start playing, or other people using hard drives to finish loading in. Either way, I tested today's games at the low settings, but I left texture and material quality on the highest setting. This preserves a lot of graphical detail surprisingly, while also giving the 1080 the best possible shot at tackling these games. I'm not about to put Grandpa up against a football team. Either way, let's begin and take a look at the card and see whether or not it's worth picking up. To start somewhat slow, I began testing with Apex Legends, a DirectX 11 Source Engine derived game from 2019. 1080p performance was 100% playable, and for some people this would be perfect for a variable refresh 120Hz display. But turn the resolution up to 1440p and the frame rates remain perfectly playable, with an average and 1% low of 105 and 77 FPS respectively. It's not a hyper competitive 300 FPS like some people prefer but if your expectations are reasonable, then it's hard to be disappointed with the card. 4K brought the card down to playable, but not really competitive performance, with the 1% low of 42 and average of 54. It's nothing to scoff at, but keep in mind that the game is already set to the lowest settings besides textures, so we can't really do much to improve performance besides do some sort of resolution scaling. 
it might be worth checking out the dynamic resolution feature in Apex if you're looking to play at 4K on the 1080, as that will provide you much smoother performance overall. Battlefield 1, another DirectX 11 title, is a Frostbite Engine game from 2016 that's made a minor resurgence in recent years. 1080p performance was great and flirted with the engine frame rate limit at 200 FPS. The average came out to be 194, with the 1% lows at 108, showing that this card still has the chops to dominate in popular DX11 titles. 1440p was another strong performance from the 1080, with an average and 1% low of 155 and 91 FPS. 4K performed playably as well, but for the best and most consistent performance I'd stick to the lower resolutions. Expanding on this engine but moving into DirectX 12, Battlefield 2042 saw performance nearly have itself. 4K was just downright unplayable, as for some reason this game just doesn't feel like it's running properly when it's at or below 30 FPS. It feels like the card is trying its hardest, but it's tripping over itself with the limited bandwidth and smaller transistor count. 1080p saw performance that was adequate and left me feeling satisfied, but 1440p was also a bit on the struggle bus. The 1% low of 42 doesn't indicate much stuttering, but the average and maximum of 55 and 62 FPS show that the card isn't achieving a high variance in overall frame rate. This might sound good, but with performance hanging at just under the 60 FPS mark, it's kind of frustrating to play as it almost feels great, but it just is unable to deliver. Circling back around to 1080p, the average and 1% low of 85 and 56 FPS paint a pretty stable picture, and kind of reiterating, I'd probably stick to 1080p with this card in this game, but the fact that you're able to turn the setting up is a testament to the customizability of the platform. Borderlands 3, in this case running on DirectX 11 mode because it ran better on this card, performed super well at 1080 and 1440p but kinda fell off at 4k. The average and 1% low of 129 and 85 FPS at 1080p show strong performance and hint at what the 1080 is capable of. The 1440p average and 1% low of 89 and 72 were still playable, and although it's not high refresh rate, it's hard to complain given the price of the 1080. 4K performance while averaging 48 FPS and a 1% low of 40 never felt unplayable. I guess this is one of those games where playing below 60 FPS doesn't feel that noticeable. Either way, no matter what resolution you choose to play this game at, it'll feel pretty good to play, and for the best fluidity I'd still lower the resolution to 1440p to preserve the extra frames. Borderlands 3 is surprisingly fun though and I'll definitely be digging into it more on the 1080 after this review goes live. Up next is another DirectX 11 game, but this time is known for bringing VCs to their knees. Crisis Remastered, although it is more optimized than its OG counterpart, is still challenging to run on lower end hardware. Surprisingly though, the 1080 pulled through and delivered playable performance throughout. At 1080p, the average of 199 shows strong performance in a majority of scenes but the 1% low of 85 tells a story of some stuttering. It wasn't fully captured in the performance metrics gathered, but I do know that this game is prone to micro-stuttering. This may be that phenomenon rearing its ugly head, especially as we become more GPU-bound as resolution increases, but I'd like to emphasize the fact that the majority of the game ran perfectly fine. Coming up to 1440p, and the average and 1% low of 138 and 107 FPS felt more consistent, even though it was lower on average than at 1080p. 4K was also technically playable, with a respective average and 1% low of 76 and 59 FPS, but came with some additional stuttering that occurred when explosions filled up the screen. This happens in almost all games though, so it's not unique to Crisis but it's simply more pronounced here as the frame rates are lower in a relativistic sense. The performance on display from a card that's less than $200 now is pretty impressive, and for 1080p it would be a great experience. Cyberpunk 2077, the current gen crisis, performed about where I expected it to at 1080 and 1440p, but 4K was just downright unplayable as it was an inconsistent mess. Starting off at 1080p, and the average of 74 FPS combined with the still very manageable 1% low of 55, show that the 1080 is still capable of playing these games comfortably, 
just not at higher resolutions. 1440p brought the average and 1% low to 48 and 39 FPS respectively, which while still playable and felt perfectly fine in this game, isn't really ideal. 4K returned an average and 1% low of 25 and 20 FPS, with the maximum coming in at 29. The days of the 1080s 4K reign are over, but as long as you can manage your expectations with this hardware and software combination, I can see this being a budget beast to play through the game at 1080p 60fps. Cyberpunk isn't really known for running well on, well, come to think of it really anything, but the 1080 is able to muscle through and show off some of the power its GPU core still possesses. The next games I decided to merge into one benchmark because after repeated testing the performance turned out to be identical between the two titles. Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2.0 both ran fine on the 1080 at 1080p, showing eerily similar performance figures to the previous title, Cyberpunk 2077. The card returned an average of 83 FPS and a 1% low of 54, showing that the game remained playable, but for ultra-competitive gamers this may not be enough. At 1440p, the 1080 is almost able to cough up an average of 60 FPS but ultimately some stuttering, shown by the 1% low of 35, pulled the average down, despite it running at around 60 FPS most of the time. 4K was basically unplayable considering this is a competitive first-person shooter, with an average and 1% low of 32 and 20 FPS. Like the general trend this card has been exhibiting, it offers great 1080p performance, borderline fine performance at 1440p, and mostly unplayable at 4K. If you're eyeing up a 1080 to play Warzone or Modern Warfare 2, then I recommend sticking to 1080p and only venturing beyond if you're comfortable with the 60fps experience. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, running using the Enhanced DirectX 11 setting, was beyond playable at almost all times at all resolutions. There isn't much to really talk about as nothing went horribly wrong but I think that the average and 1% low of 229 and 148 FPS at 1080p speak for themselves in terms of the power this card has on tap. 1440p saw an average and 1% low of 161 and 124 FPS, which is still very playable and competitive. 4K was even playable, with an average of 100 and 1% low of 83 FPS. This card shows overall strong scaling between the resolutions and despite it being almost 7 years old, it still can destroy some more recent games. I don't really have anything else to say about this combination other than that it ran smoothly and played well, which is all I can really ask for from a competent graphics card. Our next and final benchmark is the last gen Rage title, built on Vulcan. The reason I included this game and not GTA 5 is because Red Dead 2 is probably closer to GTA 6 in terms of tech than it is to GTA 5. And with the leaks that happened in the past year or so, that leaked software was actually running on a GTX 1080. It was watermarked in the video as the primary display driver, so I figured it would be more appropriate to focus on the future instead of the past. As if Red Dead runs fine on this card, so will GTA 5, and probably the upcoming GTA 6. Either way, Red Dead Redemption 2 is a rootin' tootin' lootin' shootin' simulator that's a lot more fun than I'd like to admit. And despite the high-end graphical effects work even at the low settings, the 1080 returned an average and 1% low of 70 and 30 FPS at 1080p. The 1% low may throw you off, but this game is one of those games that just feel fine at 30 FPS. It more so indicates some stuttering, but during gameplay I didn't really notice it. 1440p was also playable, with the 54fps average and a 1% low of 24, and it made the game world much more crisp, as the temporal anti-aliasing has more information to work with. 4K was also technically playable, but the 1% low of 14fps was very noticeable with an average of 31, and a maximum of 37. Red Dead 2 was overall a blast on the 1080, and for a budget build it would be hard to beat for the price. All in all, the GTX 1080 performs well in DirectX 11 games and a variety of newer titles. The card exhibited proper scaling in all the games tested, helping to indicate that while the card may not be 4K ready anymore, 
it's still a powerful piece of tech that's up to the task of driving a 1080p display. While it probably won't be at a high refresh rate, the experience on this car definitely isn't bad and is ultimately superior to the weaker and cheaper GTX 1070. Despite that card coming in at about 150 USD, the 1080 will just last longer and perform more consistently in newer titles. The stronger memory subsystem, combined with the slightly stronger core, allows games to stretch their legs more. But if 1080s aren't readily available in your area, cards that are a ballpark equivalent would be the RTX 2060 6GB, a 1070 Ti, or a Radeon Vega 64. The Vega card would actually be an interesting comparison, as the HBM memory buffer might help it out more in games and especially scientific workloads. I think though that for 2023, this card should probably start to be considered somewhere along the base level of performance that you'd want to see in a budget graphics card. Something like the RX 6600, which is generally considered the best bang for buck new GPU, is roughly 10% faster while being an additional $30 to $50 depending on pricing in your area. The other budget king, the RX 570 and the venerable GTX 970, are starting to get kind of long in the tooth and are struggling in a lot of modern titles, even at low settings. I've been getting some comments in recent months on my 970 review that I did going on two years ago now, and from what I'm seeing people are saying that that card is going strong but is struggling. It's sad to say that the reign of the 570 and 1050 Ti are starting to come to an end. But at the end of the day, the performance per dollar that you get from budget cards available today is significantly higher than cards available when I first started this channel almost five and a half years ago. Keep an eye out for the GTX 1080. It was a beast of a card back in the day, and streams of that performance sometimes glint through in modern titles. I wouldn't call it a next-gen experience, but what it does do, it does pretty damn well, and I can't recommend it enough. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you think of the 1080. Is it a card that you're interested in purchasing, or are you just stopping by to see how it performs? Either way, I'm glad that you stuck through the video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.